Welcome to the RightsCon studio. I'm Melissa Chan, and we're in conversation the next 30 minutes with Samantha Power. She is the administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. And from 2013 to 2017, she served in the Obama-Biden administration as the 28th U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations. She'll be in conversation with Anne-Marie Slaughter of uh, New America. She is CEO of New America and also former Director of Policy Planning at the U.S. State Department. They will discuss how to build an inclusive and rights-respecting digital future. Anne-Marie, over to you. Thank you, RightsCon. It is an honor to be here with you and with this incredible global community. It's also a pleasure and an honor to be in conversation with my friend, my former colleague, and my former student, US, USAID's administrator, Samantha Power. Samantha, over to you. Once a student, Anne-Marie, always a student. No, it's great to be here, and uh, it couldn't be a more, a more timely conversation, more important one, given the pace of technological innovation and penetration around the world. So I don't have to tell you that the challenges you're facing, we're all facing, are mounting by the day. We have war in Europe and in Africa, growing inequality, social fracturing in every conceivable way, and declining trust in democratic institutions and processes. It's also clear that digital technologies in the hands of unscrupulous uh, and, uh, or simply uncaring uh, creators and users are making those outcomes worse. So of all the challenges that we face in the sort of intersecting problem space, what do you see as the most urgent, uh, both in terms of, of promise and of peril? Well, it's no secret that if we are to meet any of our development objectives globally, technology and the use of data and bringing in machine learning and AI, I mean, all of these are going to be incredible assets, whether in the realm of public health, in the realm of climate forecasting and soil mapping, which we're doing a lot of in light of the food security crisis. So again, the potential for positive impact of the use of these tools, I think, knows no bounds. But unfortunately, <laughs> there's a lot of other things going on as well, as you say, in, in the technology space. The misappropriation of these tools uh, to crack down on citizens who are exercising their rights, um, surveying those citizens and using information gathered through that surveillance, uh, again, to accelerate crackdowns as part of this democracy re recession. There's no question governments are getting savvier at doing that, learning from one another in all the wrong ways. Um, but also just in terms of what exists on platforms, and we know this in the United States, is that all along the kind of content propagation has outpaced potential for content mitigation. Um, and whether, regardless of where you think various lines should be drawn in terms of the appropriateness of online conduct, and there are a range of views I know on that, I think it'd be hard to look back you know, at the last 10 years and say that it's been intentionality that has dictated, you know, where those lines are drawn, right? It's, it's much, you know, if in a, a social media platform sets up in a developing country like Myanmar um, or even a more advanced uh, country like Sri Lanka, chances are, you know, it's going to be a little bit of a free-for-all in the first instance, and you're not going to have people even in sufficiently staffing those operations to even be able to take 911 phone calls, right? And, and, and to hear the sirens if they're uh, issued, whether around incitement to violence or again, other kinds of um, online conduct that, that uh, one would really wanna be vigilant about. So I think we're at a moment, and that's why this conversation, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for, for facilitating it and for your leadership in this domain as well, and for that of everybody who's watching. But thinking through, you know, what, what does a rules of the road look like that can prevent misuse and abuse? What is USAID's and, and other development donors? What is our comparative advantage to be involved in those conversations? We're a government, you know, these, any kind of code of conduct, uh, you know, needs to be uh, developed by the people who 
who use these platforms, who develop these platforms, who are involved in governance in the countries in question, in, in the countries in which USAID works. Uh, but, you know, thinking about how we guard against misuse in a much more proactive way than we are right now. And I, by the we, I mean the royal we as a community of humanity. And how can we be more intentional, given that so much of this outpaced that intentionality about the values that we are embedding in the development and the design of technologies? Um, algorithms of all kinds, you know, can have very profound human consequences um, and often human costs. And so that kind of intentionality is something we really need in great haste uh, to, 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 uh, to embed, you know, again, in, in design, in governance, in participation. And I, I think that's uh, a, a, an inflection point that we're at right now that we cannot afford to miss. You, you make a number, number of key points. I think the, the point that propagation outruns mitigation and that, of course, there are countless unintended consequences, so in some cases with negligence, maybe in some cases uh, with malintent, but that the, the overall runs so fast and is so complicated. And that's been true of all technologies, all new technologies, right? There's huge promise uh, and there's peril. But at this point, we have to come together to think through what a rights respecting common digital future looks like. So can you talk a little bit more about how you see that process? Because USAID is, has really been pushing that process in the context of the Summit for Democracies. Absolutely. So, so President Biden convened that summit um, very much growing out of his personal commitment and his recognition about how um, so many of the harms um, that occur on or are abetted or accelerated by uh, technology are ones that we, we see in this country and we see happening around the world when you know, many of the private sector actors are actually based here in the United States, giving us, I think, a special responsibility uh, to look at this. So in the context of the Summit of Democracy, we have launched something called the Advancing Digital Democracy Program. And this is, again, one pillar uh, of uh, the Presidential Initiative for Democratic Renewal. So it's not the only aspect of that. There's much to be said about anti-corruption work and election infrastructure security and the like. Uh, but here, you know, really thinking about what uh, a safe, inclusive, rights regarding digital ecosystem can look like. And what we're doing is we are inviting the donor community, so donors from all around the world, the private sector, of course, civil society advocates, digital rights activists, academics, philanthropies and foundations and the like um, to, to join us here. And the idea is uh, to embed democratic values and respect for human rights across the countries in which we are working, entire digital ecosystems. And, and that is to build resilience to digital authoritarianism that might not yet have taken root, uh, but is always out there lurking, um, to think through, again, how those stakeholders can come together to try to roll back the rollback, you might say, or, or yeah. slide forward after the backsliding in this space. <laughs> And that's you know the toolkit that you know well from from your time trying to bring the development and diplomatic tools uh, together as part of the Obama administration. Uh, but there's diplomacy involved in this. Uh, there's uh, you know certainly we would hope that Congress uh, would be part of this effort by actually putting in place the kind of legal and regulatory reform that can help on the domestic front. So to be clear. We at USAID, again, can't dictate that, um, but President Biden is very clear on, on what his ambitions are and aspirations are in that space, because what we do here you know, absolutely has to be coupled with that kind of legal and regulatory reform. But right now, we're going to pilot this so-called ad approach against advancing digital democracy um, in the country of Serbia. And we're going to research and are in the process of figuring out what other digital environments lend themselves uh, to bringing, again, all of these stakeholders uh, together. Uh, if you are interested in joining us in this idea of advancing digital democracy in, in all of its facets, 
Uh, you can contribute funds or in-kind services to programming. You could do whatever you are already doing, and we can talk about how to align what you are doing you know, under this umbrella perhaps, or, or you can stay under your own umbrella, but like, let's actually figure out how, how to coordinate. And on the RightsCon event page, I think you'll see uh, you know, more details on that. But, but again, the idea is you know, taking stock of where we are, where the setbacks have been, and working with countries. We have entree through our 80 missions around the world uh, at USAID and of course our ambassadors and our whole country teams, as well as our catalytic uh, convening power uh, with the private sector, I hope, but also again with, with other donors. And so I think there's a, a real chance to try to kind of refresh uh, uh, what exactly the approach is that citizens and civil society and even government officials would wish to take, were they not so far down the road that they are on right now? You know, how do you kind of hit the pause button, take stock, and actually then try to embed the kinds of values that do seem to be uh, not central uh, to to how digital ecosystems are necessarily thought about right now in many parts of the world? You're actually talking about a democratic process for figuring out a democratic uh, digital future, Shocking. right? The, 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 I know, but the messiness of it and the Messy and the horizontality future. of it, right? It's extraordinary to me. I mean, you're there, you are the administrator of a large government bureaucracy, but you're effectively inviting all the different stakeholders into a much more horizontal process, a collective process, uh, and one, as you say, that there, there are many different ways people can contribute. I wanted to, to uh, push a little further on, on what that will take in terms of culture change. And you and I have both done this from government. We've both done this in academia. You can, you know, you can launch a new initiative. You can hand out a, a new set of ideas, but ultimately, you're only going to get change with culture change and with your long uh, work in human rights, uh, establishing a culture of human rights in American diplomacy and, and more globally took decades. Um, so how do we how do we create new norms around this kind of process? in the digital space. At New America, we talk about people-centered policy, putting people at the center of policy, but that means actually not just putting them at the center like you're the problem, rather it's it's the solutions uh, that the people closest to the problem come up with. And that's a, a you know a culture shift that the communities at, at, here at RightsCon, the activists, the movement leaders, the policy advocates, academics, civil society, and really media are craving that kind of, of culture shift. So I wondered if you'd talk a little bit more about how USAID sees that happening. Well, I think, um, first of all, this is a, a, a question that we need to crowdsource, continue to crowdsource. I think this <laughs> initiative really has come out of these kinds of conversations. But famously, as you know well, Anne-Marie, in, in behavioral science, uh, you know, when you tell someone to eat healthier, uh, they can't because it's not at all prescriptive. If you tell somebody to drink 2% milk instead of whole milk, that, that one can do. There's, you know, great adherence to that. Similarly, I always say this to my team, like when we say, we've got to change the culture, right? Like, that's like eat healthier, you know, what, what, what does that mean? What, what is the action item for me? So uh, again, I don't pretend to have the answers here, but I am, I keep coming back to this idea of intentionality. You know, if you look at the generations of engineers and computer scientists that were sent out into the world, um, you know, I haven't done a survey. I'm sure someone has, uh, again, this is not my specialty, but I would suspect that the amount of curriculum attention dedicated to questions of ethics or human rights norms or the potential ulterior effects was quite modest next to the rich array of more technical capabilities that, that students um, were able to get access to through their you know, undergraduate or their graduate schooling. We, we've set up a partnership with the Mozilla Foundation to expand what it calls its Responsible Computer Science Challenge, which is about yeah. building curricula that integrate ethics within computer science training 
and trying to educate a new wave of engineers. And our, our friend Jeremy Weinstein, uh, who's a professor at Stanford, uh, you know, has been doing such important work out there, embedding again uh, with his colleagues in the computer science department this kind of merger of consideration of tech along with consideration of tech consequences. And I think I think the more that that you know, again, my domain is not domestic here in the United States, but fundamentally this is going to have to happen in the United States, uh, you know, and, and, and the kinds of things that are happening at places like Stanford have, have to be happening across the board, including kids who are younger than university students. And, and part of it is also, you know, demand driven, you know, do the tech companies, are they hearing from those who are using their platforms that this matters, that values matter? And I think we've seen more of that kind of accountability, public accountability, but perhaps not yet the kind of groundswell uh, that would get gen generate in and of itself, uh, you know, sufficient uh, change or traction. I'm really excited about what we're doing together, Anne-Marie. Um, so USAID and New America to try to now kick off a multi-stakeholder effort to develop a technologist code of ethics. I'm the daughter of uh, a mother who's a physician, and this is inspired by the Hippocratic Oath uh, in medicine. And that's, again, it's 2022. I don't know how uh, th this kind of uh, you know, initiative um, hasn't sort of culminated yet, but the purposes of this kind of code would be to support technologists, the civil society actors, and the academics to come together to document a set of principles for how technology should uphold democratic values and human rights. And then back to the curriculum point, to imbue in, in principle every up and coming technologist with some sworn commitment to these ideals. So that intentionality and that embrace of those principles takes hold you know, as someone goes forth into the world to do their work. And then to operationalize these ideals in the spaces where technologists work and learn. So that'd be universities, but also the companies themselves. And I guess what I will say is where the government, as I said earlier, you know, this is not about the U.S. government, uh, you know, drafting something of this ambition and of this uh, normative nature. But, you know, we and you together, we can try to facilitate the creation of spaces whereby the true stakeholders, you know, to these platforms come together and facilitate a transparent, collaborative, inclusive process, try to bring as much diversity into the room as possible. It is going to be Chaotic, I think it's it's fair to say, but as uh, two veterans here of multilateral negotiations in the international space, um, a lot of the things we now count on as as global norms and and really global goods have come about through processes of the of that nature. But usually they're very statist, and they haven't included the array of people who who stand most to benefit, but also most to lose from not having these values embedded. Um, so there's gonna be, just to preview the RightsCon panel on a technologist code of ethics, and that's right after this conversation. And they're gonna gather thoughts, I think, on the code um, from RightsCon uh, attendees. And, and again, we, we stand ready, and I, I, you can speak for, for New America, but um, we're just very excited not to draft the code uh, but to use our convening power um, in order to bring people together because, you know, we're already way late on this, uh, given how far uh, things have evolved in so many countries around the world, including our own. You know, it, it really is extraordinary that there is not a technologist code of ethics. I mean, you were talking about the Hippocratic Oath, but you and I were both lawyers, uh, and we also all had to take legal profession, and there is obviously a legal code of ethics. And part of what we're, we're doing together, and New America's been doing for almost a decade, is to build an entire field of public interest technology. So Jeremy Weinstein and the Stanford Impact Lab have been leaders in the public interest technology university network so that somebody who wants to be a technologist can think about you know, being a technologist at USAID or in their local community, you know, ma making traffic better or housing better so that we, we have a public interest track for technologists and a code of ethics for all technologists, just as you would for other professions. 
It's harder because technologist is not as defined as lawyer or doctor. On the other hand, there are an awful lot of, of people who are designers or engineers who would describe themselves uh, that way. And so to be to be facilitating the co-creation of this technologist code of ethics, because I think that's really that kind of describes how we're going to work together at New America, our digital impact and governance initiative will be working directly uh, with USAID, uh, but also, you know, our Open Technology Institute and Ranking Digital Rights Program, which are sort of approach these issues from other perspectives will be in, engaged as well. So I would also encourage everybody to, to participate on, on that panel. I wanted to ask you, though, how you see specifically the role of the private sector, because this is, you know, the private sector is vital here in some ways. Certainly there are big, massive private companies who are part of the problem, but they also have to be part of the solution. So I'd love for you to talk about how you see uh, their role. Well, let me let me just share um, a little bit of an oblique uh, anecdote. Uh, you know, even in this in this domain, um, I, I came from uh, traveling to the Ukrainian border not long ago and was in a couple of the frontline countries that are sheltering Ukrainian refugees. And <laughs> the amount of misinformation, um, the amount of, you know, if not outright incitement, borderline incitement, um, the amount of lies, you know, relevant to everything from COVID vaccines to climate change. And again, we're very familiar with that misinformation here. Um, but putting all of that to one side, the insufficiency among certain private sector actors of infrastructure, it's what I alluded to at the beginning, I was, I was talking about Myanmar and Sri Lanka, this is Europe, and not having people who spoke the language who could do uh, you know, that kind of content uh, uh, oversight, right? That that would be needed, in, whether through you know algorithms or with with human judgment, uh, you know, attached in real time. I mean, just it, it, from talking to the heads of state of countries, from talking to civil society, that infrastructure uh, was, let's just put it this way, woefully insufficient. It existed; there was something there. It had been built up a little bit, but nowhere near uh, an ability to keep pace with what was actually the amount of information on the platform. Anyway, so I came back and I reached out to the company that should go, should go nameless at a very senior level. And what was remarkable, Emory, is, is the extent to which their understanding of what the content oversight looked like in these two European countries, how just radically that departed from the government's understanding, from the civil society actors' understanding who actually worked in the area like you do at New America of actually looking at tech and governance and so forth. And, you know, I, I wasn't even, I, I can't say that the impression that I got was 100% right, or, but what I know is that the, the, the canyon that separated the, the company's understanding of what was actually in place and what they were doing and, and what at least pretty relevant citizens like the president of the country understood were just radically different. And so, it just gets to it's government that happens a lot, right? Like inputs versus outcomes. We 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 always have to. We, like, are, we are we talking about how many trainings we had, or are we talking about anything being you know kind of different in the world? Learned. And and this was like that. It was it was that. And so, just to say that more interaction. I mean, really, one can just make a, a kind of boring process point out of this. Uh, you know, there's a critique implicit in it, of course, but but the boring process point is. Like those, those uh, gaps of understanding that 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 ability to kind of hold a mirror up to what certain private sector actors think that they are doing, and I may sound naive, because I know there are some who just say, "Oh no, they know they're not doing anything." But you know, regardless, we need to test the proposition, and that accountability is absolutely critical. So, so thinking at USAID missions, how we are taking advantage of the context that we have. I mean, you have heads of states of countries who, who wouldn't know who to call at the big social media companies, right? And here we are, uh, you know, uh, the largest development humanitarian agency in the world. Like we should use our contacts in order to be able to channel the concerns that, that come, come out of developing countries in particular, where the decisions made so far away from where the harms 
could happen, you know, are just seem like they're, they're being made on Mars, you know, that they're completely out of reach. So that's one aspect. On the code itself, I think we want to encourage active participation um, in developing this tech code of ethics. Again, you've been at this, Emory, for uh, a long while at, at New America, you know, really kind of ahead of the curve, I think, on, on some of this thinking. Um, and then, you know, once the code of conduct is developed, uh, messy though that process will be, and we have norms, then it's incumbent on the, the rest of us to do everything we can to enlist the private sector to embrace those norms for entry level officials and for people who've been operating uh, without at least formalized norms uh, for quite some time. So that is the end of our time and just the right note uh, to end on. And I just want to wrap it up in the sense of you've heard an USAID's Advancing Digital Democracy initiative announced at the Summit for Democracy and now specifically inviting everyone at this conference, but more broadly, all the different members of the digital ecosystem to participate in thinking through the kinds of guardrails and norms, norms that have to be inclusive uh, and transparent and democratic, uh, and they have to advance a rights respecting digital future. So we're inviting you to participate and more specifically, on a technologist code of ethics, which is one piece of that larger ecosystem of building what truly has to be a democratic digital future. So Administrator Power, such a pleasure to be able to be in this conversation with you and thanks so much. No, thanks. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And I, I come back to something our, our former boss, President Obama, uh, liked to say back when we were in government together, which is when you're faced with something like this, that it can just be very overwhelming, um, uh, you know, he would sometimes, and I'd say, let's solve the whole problem at once and, and be, you know, <laughs> super ambitious. And, and this is really unwieldy and there's so many stakeholders involved, but he liked to say better is good. Uh, and I always just, I just love that expression, right? And he would say, and it turns out, you know, better is often a hell of a lot harder than worse. So, you know, this is not a panacea, right? There's so much that we at USAID and, and, and all of us who care about the risk to democracy and human rights around the world in the digital space that we need to work on, underlying infrastructure, how that infrastructure is adopted, the digital services and platforms that operate on the infrastructure and the governance, right? Both at the companies and in the countries in question. And there's so many stakeholders it, you know, there's a lot here. And I, it may sound to some who are pretty frustrated at the pace of change and reform, you know, that this is just taking one slice and, but better is good. And, and the, the you know, to, to not have norms, to not have that intentionality, I think we know where that path has taken us. And that's, you know, arguably been at least one contributor, that absence of the injection of ethics and a discussion of human rights and outcomes um, you know, across the board. So really excited to go forward and thrilled to have got to have this conversation with you, Anne-Marie, and thanks to, to everybody who's hosting and everybody who's out there in the audience. We need you uh, very, very badly. So, so thank you for all you do every day and back to you, Melissa. And that's it. Thanks for joining us and as always, Stay engaged.